Well, over the next couple of days, we're going to have some uh, reasonably warm weather. It's not going to be great, but it'll be enough that I can get a few things done on the old Thunderbird. Sorry for the delay, but you know, we like I said, we were, if you watched the last video, we were up in, uh, my son and I were up in uh, Seattle, Washington for 10 or 11 days. And we came back, and then right after that, we ran into Thanksgiving, and then the wife, you know, she wanted to go do some shopping, and I had to catch up on a lot of other things. So, you know, yada, 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 right? Yeah, okay. Anyway, we're back at it. Uh, I don't know how many things we're going to get done over the next couple of days. It'll be a little of this, a little of that. So let's get cranked. Uh, there's one other thing I wanted to show you, too. Ooh, it's chilly in here. Whew. Once it gets cold in these places that are... This, this place is hyperventilated, I mean hyper-insulated, uh, <laughs> hyperventilated too probably, but it's, it, it keeps, not only keeps the heat in, but it keeps cold in. Uh, in addition to, uh, you know, every other thing, I did get a few minutes to poke around the television and work on it, and I'll show you what we found. We found a couple of bad uh, capacitors, one of them being a uh, mica capa uh, capacitor, which is in the vertical circuit, and I found a, a yellow capacitor like this one here, unfortunately it had brown ends on it when I got them. I thought they might be good, but as it turned out, they weren't. So I'm not gonna use this one, I'm gonna throw it away. Uh, the two that I had just weren't, they just weren't good. So I don't know when I bought them, it's been quite a while. But anyway, a capacitor that's the same value, which is, uh, this is a 154K, I believe it is. Uh, maybe one a little bit larger. I bought several different kinds, I'm gonna get rid of them all. And this, uh, so this was in a horizontal circuit bad and, and I changed them out. This was in the vertical circuit, bad. So I changed it out. Let me show you what happened. Uh, those of you who remember, we had nothing on the screen for this television, nothing. Well, this is what we have now after changing out those two capacitors. It's amazing what two little tiny capacitors can do to a TV. I mean, it was just stone dead. There was not even a glimmer of a raster on this thing. But anyway, now I have to do an alignment on the, uh, the horizontal oscillator. Uh, whenever I hook up the VCR to it, I get those slanted lines like this, you know, no matter what I do, I can't get them to jack up and uh, fly right. So, but that's our fault. Uh, you know, we replaced a couple other parts that, uh, they weren't bad, but I wanted to put them in and get some new stuff in there. This is kind of a neat little TV. I plan, this is one I'm going to keep forever. It's my very first TV I ever restored. You know, it's kind of a lot of sentimental value here. And I want to watch some old uh, westerns on it, old black and white westerns. I've got lots of uh, DVDs of those, uh, everything, all kinds of stuff. Roy Rogers, I think. I mean, you name it. It's going to be kind of fun. You know, when the weather warms up, I can just sit in here with a Coke. And I think I'll just leave it right here in the corner behind me and be able to watch some TV once in a while whenever I get tired of working on the Thunderbird. Speaking of the Thunderbird, let's get out there and take a look and see what we're going to do with that uh, today. Well, as you can see, all my front end parts are no longer on this table. Uh, I had to take them down and put them on this tarp because wifey said she wanted a table put in the house for Thanksgiving to put the food on, so that's what we did. <laughs> you know, I had several tables until that Johnny Umpress, that northern Arkansas Yankee, came down here and just took my tables out in his pickup truck, threatened me with some guy named Two, two, two Thumbs Tony or whatever his name was. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're going to leave it there for a while longer, and then I'll pick it up and put it back on. But uh, over here I have a couple of items. We'll start with these. Uh, this is our, this is our uh, proportioning valve, and I, you know, I kind of wonder, how am I going to put that in the car? How am I going to hook this thing somewhere in the fender? Or the firewall or something well I came up with an idea like this Brendan gave me an idea on uh, what to do with the old one if I could rebuild it but that that whole thing didn't pan out but I went ahead and stayed with the idea and figured out a way to use it to put this one where it needs to go I'll show you how that's done before the end of the video also I've decided to go ahead and try restoring this uh, caliper I'm going to take a little uh, well let me let me show you what I'm going to do it with now here's my way of thinking. Uh, I've got some uh, uh, navel jelly left. I got a little bit of a little wire brush. It's brass. I got a toothbrush and some WD-40, which uh, works pretty good for cleaning. This is electrical spray and a little bit of sandpaper. And I think if I put a little bit of elbow grease in this, I might be able to bring it back from the dead. We'll know by the end of the video. All right, let's see what I can start doing on this. Uh, 
I'll tell you, this is going to be a lot of work, I'll tell you. Yes. I may have to wind up soaking this baby in the old uh, vinegar for about a week or two. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to give it a couple hours and see what it looks like. If it's a lot of work, I'm not even going to mess with it. But I think I can handle it. I think I can handle it. Well, right now, I'm putting the finishing touches on my uh, gas line. Giving it a few, there's a few spots that got scraped up in the process of putting it on. I've still got to uh, put a little undercoating over the top of it. And then uh, the only thing that really got done wrong <laughs> is uh, this loop was a little too high. It should have been down here at this level right here. I made it too high, but eh, that's the way it goes, you know. I got to do a little spray painting in the corner there. Would have been nicer if I could have had it lower, but I'm not going to go through it all again. That was very difficult to bend. And uh, right there is our rubber hose, which it calls for in the manual, right there. And uh, I ran out of line, of course, so I had to put a little short piece of uh, rubber hose here with uh, American-made clamps again. Uh, and I stabilized it with another clamp right here to make sure it stayed nice and tight and it's nice and secure. It's not going anywhere. Okay. The only thing I have left to do is I got to pick up a couple of American uh, clamps again and uh, to put on the hose right here. Right here and where it connects on to the uh, fuel pump. I'll probably move that around just a little bit. There's plenty of clearance there, but I'd like to have just a little bit more. I think I can kind of bend it out of the way a little bit. I don't want it too close. But anyway, uh, that'll be about it. Put a little more paint here and there. And throw a little uh, undercoating on, and that part will be done. I am so glad. Oh, what the heck. I went ahead and bent it right now. It's got plenty of clearance here from the uh, fender, inner fender well and plenty of clearance around this sway bar. So we're good to go on that. Good to go. Now let's we'll throw a little paint up in there. I'll tell you what guys, uh, I'm tired of messing with brake lines and gas lines for a while. I do a little change of pace. This master cylinder has got to come off. The 9 16 bolts, there's only two of them, one on each side. I've already got all the brake lines loose. I had taken those loose earlier or broke them off because they were so rusted. So let's get those two bolts out. Uh, one of them's right down there on the side. You can see there's one just like it on the other side. All right, they're out. Now let's see. Come on, baby, you got to come off of there. I don't think there's anything holding it on. It might be. Usually, usually not. Let me take two hands of this baby. Well, there she is, but as I expected, it just came right out. It was just wanting to be a little stubborn. That's all. It was kind of hanging up on this one bolt. And what we have here is a little uh, little piston that's connected to a diaphragm inside this booster. Now, what happens is when you hit your brakes and you have a booster on your car, uh, the vacuum operates the diaphragm, which enables this thing to push forward. And when this thing pushes forward, it's hooked to that diaphragm. I have to check to see if that diaphragm has any holes. It looks to be okay, but, you know, looks are very deceiving when it comes to something like this. It's got some dirt and crud and crap in it, so chances are it's no good. I don't know. I'm gonna, I've, got a, uh, I've got a pump that I can pull a vacuum on it with, take it up to about anywhere from 5 to 8 PSI, see if it holds the vacuum, and if it does, well, it'll be good, but it'll have to come off of there. Uh, to do that right. I want to do it. Not, not only do I want to check the vacuum, I want to show you folks how to adjust that pin, that, that uh, little rod there that's connected to the diaphragm and how it relates to this little baby right there where it goes in. It goes in right there. It only goes in so far and then it hits. So the adjustment, you know, years ago I would just take a master cylinder, throw it on the way I went, you know, if it was bad swap it out and you know, drive away everything's fine however you know you learn with time that hey that's not quite the way it works and i've had some brake problems after i've done that and the reason being is that the tip of that rod right there has to hit has to has to be the right length to properly hit the uh this kind of a round thing at the bottom down there just like the shape you see right there at the end of the rod it has to hit right if it's too far back or too far forward, if it's too far forward, it's letting fluid bypass. If it's too far back, you have to push your pedal further in order to get your master cylinder to work. But we'll cover that. 
at a later date when it gets a little bit warmer. We're going to have to do some measuring. I'm going to have to take that off, which means I got to go inside the car and disconnect it from the, uh, probably bolt it on from the inside through the firewall. I don't know. I haven't really looked at it. But we finally got our master cylinder off, which gives us a lot more room down here to work. But that's, that's pretty mangy looking right here. This gasket is kind of messed up and I don't know. I mean, you know, everything in this car I touch is nothing but rust and uh, mud wasps. <laughs> well, the heck with that small brush business. I'm really going to go ape here with the big one. I mean, I've got a lot of pistons to clean and everything. And we're going to get it. We're going to get it. We're just going to keep, keep struggling. Keep struggling. Hit it with this big mammy jammy. I've even got an electric one I can hook up if I have to. But we'll get her. Now this will be our new master cylinder we're going to put on when the time comes. I want to, I'm debating whether to paint it. I don't know what I'll do. I may clear coat it. I may paint it black. I don't know what color the original one was because I don't think the one I just took off was original. <laughs> Probably was black or something. I'll have to check. Anyway, uh, this brass fitting right here, which is your distribution block for your uh, brake lines, there's two, uh, two uh, holes in it. One for the rear that goes to your distribution uh, valve and the other one goes down to the uh, uh, front disc brakes and uh, on the other side and then there's, there's this coming out of the bottom here I think this one goes down to the front disc brakes and then uh, the other one would run over to the other side of the car to the other disc brakes set of disc brake pads but you know this is the one that originally came out of there it's kind of ratty looking I didn't like it didn't look safe to me you use this, these things several times you know and the fitting just doesn't go real tight and you get a lot of air sucking into your uh, brake system. So I wanted to try to find one original. The only place I could find one was on Max Thunderbird. Well, you won't believe this. They wanted $20 for this thing plus $10 shipping. Yeah, right. <laughs> I don't think so. Come on, guys. That's crazy. Anyway... I went down to my local O'Reilly Auto Parts and they said, go on back there in the brass bin. They know me by now. Just go out back there and have a good time in the brass bin uh, finding what you want. So I did. I came up with this one right here. It's the exact same as this, except it didn't have the fitting on the end. And I found a, a nipple that will work just fine. goes right in there with no problem. I'll tighten it on down. And uh, the total cost for both parts was eight dollars and thirteen cents and that's with tax and everything so <laughs> thirty dollars for one of these versus eight dollars and thirteen cents no contest <laughs> I'll tell you what my arms getting worn out on this and my fingers are hurting from cleaning that thing so I'll tell you well let's just move over and see if we can't get a, a ball joint put in this upper control arm here should should be a lot easier to messing around with that I'll tell you what, before we get too carried away with installing this uh, ball joint, take a look at it. You'll see that it's all round, all the way around, and uh, there's no notch in it. Well, what, what do you mean there's no notch in it? Well, let me tell you what that means. If you go to your shop manual on page 3-11, it talks about your suspension. And uh, if you look down below, it shows you a blow-up of the... <coughs> Of the ball joint and it says you have to put the ball joint in this is your control arm right here which is this part right here you have to put it with the notch toward the front of the car well yeah then, yeah of course I and mean, that was 55 years ago well <laughs> nowadays we don't have ball joints with notches in them or anything like that unless it specifically absolutely requires it well the 66 t-bird and probably all the rest of the t-birds of that era don't require it so what we're going to do is just stick that baby in there, okay? Now, they also refer to a yellow color designates the left-hand side. Now, they're not, what they're talking about there is there would be a splotch of yellow paint on the control arm itself, okay? Now, I've got my control arm upside down from the one that's in the photograph and, uh, or the blow up here. So let's go ahead and get the, uh, let's get this ball joint in and get it tightened up. It takes a 15 sixteenths wrench to tighten it up and there is no lock washer 
Now when you put your ball joint in and you tighten it all the way down, you want to make sure that this is metal against metal when you get this nut tightened all the way. Now I've, I've seen some videos and whatnot where somebody will take a little bit of grease and put it inside this cup so it makes it slide in a little easier. I'm not too crazy about that. I don't like that idea at all. I'll just draw it on down with this nut. Well, we got her all tightened down. She looks real good, metal to metal, but it still needs to be torqued. That, that nut right there still needs to be torqued. So how do we go about that? Well, you go to the book and look up the specifications. Huh, <laughs> sure. Again, the Ford manual has let us down. Let me show you. What you, it says here, you know, to torque the thing uh, to specifications. Yeah, right. It says, you know, you, all, all the nuts and everything. So when you go to specifications, which is page 340, over here, they give you the front suspension torque limits. Well, if you go down there, you'll see that the front suspension upper arm ball joint to the spindle is 60 to 80 foot-pounds. Then you have the lower arm ball joint to the spindle, again, 60 to 80 uh, foot-pounds. And then they talk about the shaft itself and the uh, the bushings that go on each end, which we've already done. Now, if you're just tuning in, the shaft itself to the cross member is this right here. And those bushings I put on are right there. Nowhere does it say anything about the torque spec of that nut underneath there. <laughs> you know, this book is real good at that. Torque at the specifications, it says, and then they don't give you the specs. Well... I'll dig around, see what I can come up with that. Maybe I can have it in the next video. Time for a coffee break. Uh, so while I'm drinking my little cup of java there, I'll go ahead and tell you what we did with our proportioning valve using all this crap right here. Now, you recall earlier in the video, I mentioned that Brendan had come up with this idea where we would put the, the old proportioning valve in here and then just put it right back on the fender. Well, since we're not using the old proportioning valve, I got and we, we bought this one to put in its place, I got thinking, you know, I went, I went down to Lowe's and I was looking around at these things and I said, maybe, maybe we can still use this sort of thing to mount it to the fender or firewall. Now, let me show you the idea I came up with. Well, there it is. That's the way we're going to do it. We went ahead and put that little pipe hole. This is actually a pipe strap that you attach to a wall and run a conduit down through the center and then tighten this around the conduit. I figured, you know, if it'll work for a conduit, maybe it'll be just right for what we need. And it turned out to be exactly what we needed because the holes line up perfect. And once it's tightened down, it can't rotate left and right because it's hitting against these two edges down here. Pretty neat. Anyway, uh... I stuck a lock washer underneath a self-locking nut uh, on top of it, so that'll double make sure it's not going to go anywhere. And then on the bottom, you know, we have our bolt with our lock washer. I'll drill a hole somewhere, and we're going to mount it to wherever it mounts. Uh, this one right here will go out to the uh, rear of the car. This one right here will go up to the master cylinder. So that's the way we're going to do that. Of course, I haven't really scoped it out and eyeballed it where exactly I want to mount it. But, you know, I want to have it somewhere where it's going to be convenient, where I can, you know, move the valve if necessary. But I don't want it to be getting a ton of jar and bang and stuff like that. But that's going to work real well, just like that. And, you know, if it turns out it doesn't, so what? We'll come up with another idea. But right now, we'll run with this one. By the way, that old TV had a really nasty uh, flyback transformer in it, and I went ahead and uh, bought one from uh, Antique Television Museum, I believe is the name of it, up in Ohio. They had one. Uh, Brendan told me it was in stock. Part number was exactly the same, so I went ahead and bought it. This is more of a preventive measure than anything else. And this here, like I said, I want this TV to, to play old movies. I don't want it crapping out. I mean, 30 days after I get it fixed. And this here also was pretty ragged. This was a uh, frequency coil. Uh, there's the part number. I can't remember what it's called. I got this schematic. Let me see. Well, I do have the schematic right here. This is a schematic we're using for all this mess. This little baby right here is that little baby right there. And what is that thing called? That's called a... Uh, well, they really don't... It's L38. It's an inductor. It's a tunable inductor. 
right there L38 this part right here is tunable and this part right here is tunable which would be the top and bottom uh, this one has a slug that's way down in there I thought it, uh, this one has a screw on the base okay see it but I uh, contacted Brendan, you know, he's an old TV guy. I'm not a TV guy. I don't know much about televisions. Everything I learn here, I'm learning for the first time, pretty much. Uh, even though I restored the TV a while back, it was running fine, and now it just crapped out, but uh, such is life. But I, I said to Brendan, I said, you know, this thing is missing the, uh, the tuning slug adjuster. And he said, no, it's in there. He said, it's just different manufacturers. He said, the tuning slug is probably down in here someplace, and you're going to have to use a long tool to get to it. Well, I got looking at it down in there with a flashlight. Sure enough, there is a slug down in there. I assume it's a separate slug from this one here. Or or whatever, I don't know. I'll just have to take his word for it. He knows more about the TVs than I do, that's for sure. Everything else, I kind of teach him as much as I can. I'm not sure it's doing much good. About time to wrap this up. It's starting to get dark. It's getting really cold in the, in the garage here. So next time we'll go ahead and remove the uh, vacuum booster and we'll see if we can't figure out a place to mount this thing uh, to determine whether or not my idea sucks or, and we may have to change it up. I don't know. You know, I'm flexible. <laughs> I've had, you know, I, I could, uh, I could, I guess I could call the guy that has the most sucky ideas. I can call Ron C up. Maybe he could figure out a way to mount that with some cardboard. I don't know. <laughs> All right, what's left? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, we got one more thing. I want you, I want you to see how my uh, caliper turned out. I worked on it for four and a half hours. What do you think, guys? Looks pretty darn nice, huh? Almost new, I'd say. But that, that looks really good, no doubt about it. Four and a half hours of back-breaking work. Until next time, this is John.